There's one aspect of formation which is repetition and morphic resonance is really a theory of repetition and habit. It says that once new forms have appeared, <clears throat> the more often they appear, the more likely they are to appear again. Um, so that helps to explain form, uh, the appearance of repetitive forms and after all most things we see are repetitive. It doesn't explain the first time uh, an oak tree appears, the first time there's a feather, the first time there's an eye, the first time there's a star or galaxy or a zinc atom or a hemoglobin molecule. Um, so there has to be in evolution as well a principle of creativity, um, a creative principle whereby new forms, new patterns can appear. We know they do appear. Um, now how we explain creativity is a, a big metaphysical question and there are several alternative answers to it. Um, I leave it open because it depends very much on people's world view. Yes, I think that there are fields that organize social groups and I've looked at these in animals because all social animals have social fields. They all have to coordinate members of the group. And when you look at flocks of starlings, for example, which we have here in England in the winter, huge flocks of up to a million birds, they fly around before dusk um, and the whole flock can change direction almost immediately without the individuals bumping into each other. They know not only where the others are, but where they're going to go. And the same is true of schools of fish. And so there's something about animal groups that they can be coordinated by some kind of invisible connection. And the best computer models of these flock behaviors treat them as, as fields, as if they're a bit like iron filings in a magnetic field. I, I think this would be a, a brilliant way of testing morphic resonance. Yeah. Um, I'm not a gamer myself, and I don't know people who program games, but... Uh, if I you can do, help. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we, and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. I'm so excited to be talking about morphic resonance. We have Dr. Rupert Sheldrake joining us on the show. Hi, Rupert. Hello, Alan. Thanks so much for coming on the program. I am very pumped. For those that don't know Rupert's background, Rupert is a biologist and 16-time author slash co-author, best known for his hypothesis of morphic resonance, which posits that natural systems inherit collective memory. He has studied developmental biology and plant physiology from Cambridge to Hyderabad, most recently fascinated with unexplained human and animal abilities. You can find his links in the bio below, sheldrake.org, as well as his YouTube and Facebook pages. Check those out. Rupert. I have absolutely loved where you've been coming from these last couple of decades. Uh, I think that what you're putting out into our world is extremely necessary for this big picture synthesis of science and spirituality, and also for it to give us a more clear metaphysical picture of what the true nature of reality really is. So that is the ultimate first principled question, and so you're really Put, putting putting energy towards unleashing that at its fullest. Let's just jump right into morphic resonance because I messaged you about this and it seems to be one of the most pressing questions around the question of metaphysics in the sense of how is it possible that a pattern of activity like a seed contains all hmm. of the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the fruits, and then it is also recursive as it has more seeds. How does a zygote contain the embryo, the baby, the child, the adult, and the potential for more humans, recursion? How does the Big Bang contain all the matter, stars, planets, civilizations, and the potential for more Big Bangs, recursion? And there's no DNA 
during cosmogenesis that dictates this morphological development. So the question we ask is what is the information? What is the pattern, the underlying habits unfolding across these examples? How does it work, Rupert? How does it relate to morphic resonance? Well, there are many forms in nature. Um, atoms are forms, molecules are forms, crystals are forms, plants and animals, planets, stars, galaxies. Um, all of these are forms in the sense that they're organized, self-organizing structures of activity. And clearly at the moment of the Big Bang, there were no forms. The universe was totally amorphous. Um, so all these forms have come into being as the universe has evolved. And the same is true of an egg. I mean, the Big Bang's like the hatching of the cosmic egg. In <laughs> um, it's kind of mythic, the modern scientific myth. Uh, um, but if you think of an embryo, a zygote, a fertilized egg, um, that doesn't contain much form either. And yet you and I have eyes and legs and arms and spleens and livers and so on. Um, none of those are in the fertilized egg. More forms appear. So both in individual development, ontogeny, and in phylogeny, the evolution of life and indeed of the entire cosmos, more forms appear from less. Now, in the case of living organisms like us, then the forms that appear are repetitions of what's happened before. Every time an oak tree grows, it's like previous oak trees. You and I are like previous humans in many respects. Um, the, every time a new star forms, it's like lots of other stars. Um, so there's one aspect of formation, which is repetition. And morphic resonance is really a theory of repetition and habit. It says that once new forms have appeared, <clears throat> the more often they appear, the more likely they are to appear again. Um, so that helps to explain form, uh, the appearance of repetitive forms. And after all, most things we see are repetitive. It doesn't explain the first time uh, an oak tree appears, the first time there's a feather, the first time there's an eye, the first time there's a star or galaxy or a zinc atom or a hemoglobin molecule. Um, so there has to be in evolution as well a principle of creativity, um, a creative principle whereby new forms, new patterns can appear. We know they do appear. Um, now, how we explain creativity is a, a big metaphysical question, and there are several alternative answers to it. Um, I leave it open because it depends very much on people's worldview. If you're a materialist and you think there's nothing but matter and chance uh, giving rise to the universe, then there's no higher purpose in anything, it's just chance. And, um, but if you think there's a guiding uh, consciousness underly underlying the whole of nature, the whole of the universe, then there could be creative mind or minds at work in this process. I'm not talking about a kind of intelligent design where it's all done in a kind of like an engineer on a drawing board. I'm thinking more of a creativity that spontaneously takes place, that makes things up as it goes along. Anyway, that's another theory of creativity. But basically, morphic resonance is a way of explaining the repetition of forms and what I'm suggesting is that the DNA that's inherited in the zygote um, has a limited role in inheritance. It doesn't do everything. Most people assume that genetic is synonymous with hereditary. Uh, it isn't. Um, what the DNA does is enables organisms to make particular proteins. It specifies the sequence of amino acids in proteins, like in your hemoglobin or in, uh, in the keratin in your skin and so on. Um, you need proteins and all the enzymes we have. Um, DNA explains that kind of inheritance, or at least the primary structure of these proteins. There's also epigenetic inheritance, the inheritance of acquired characters, which affects the expression of DNA, of genes. But most of in the inheritance of form and of instincts, um, I think is working through morphic resonance through this kind of collective memory principle. Excellent. Okay, so let's let's play off of where we, in a sense, it was. It's, it feels as though it's a little bit like uh, Plato's theory of forms and ideas to a certain extent, and also it feels as though there is a 
a deep connection between that and what you were mentioning regarding creativity and imagination and also the uh, as John von Neumann called the the universal constructor and so there there's something that that is inherent in the cosmogenesis that then downstream creates these mutations in the tape that then which we as co-creators we Im influence those mutations at one moment the imaginative idea of seeing birds and then thinking we should fly across oceans too and then all of a sudden every generation uh after that has access to flying across an ocean in half a day. Um, so th we make these mutations along, along the way. And it's almost as though it's a, it's a forms and ideas and imagination and creativity that cause that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, you see, I think what Plato was saying is that the, there's a realm of forms or ideas that gives rise to everything in this world. They're a reflection of ideal archetypes or forms. However, um, he thought those I, archetypes were totally transcendent in a kind of mind beyond the universe. Uh, what I'm saying is closer to what his student Aristotle thought. Aristotle thought that the uh, forms were actually within nature they were the souls of living things. So for Plato, every horse mm. is a reflection of an eternal horse idea beyond sp space and time. For Aristotle, every horse has an invisible horse soul which shapes its body as it grows as an embryo and underlies its instincts. And so all the, so it's not outside nature, it's in nature. And for him, soul was a natural causal organizing principle every living uh, thing had a soul. And he thought that many things were alive, including magnets and the earth and the stars. Um, so um, what Aristotle was saying is closer to what I'm saying is within nature. And it's, um, but he, like Plato, didn't think in terms of evolution. This is a much more recent idea. Um, so the idea that there's, um, they didn't think in terms of a memory in nature. They didn't need a memory in nature. If you've got an eternal uh, forms outside nature or inside nature that are fixed already, you don't need a memory. You just take that, that for granted. But if things are changing as time goes along, as the evolutionary model suggests, uh, indeed it's basic to it, then uh, the idea of memory becomes much more important because these forms are not just... Um, manifestations of eternal ready-made forms they're based on adaptations to what actually happens it, organisms are shaped by their environment and they can inherit adaptations and um, so it's not just an eternal principle now Rupert, let's touch on, you said earlier, epigenetics. I think this is very important. I think it's also very important to see where we can go beyond epigenetics with morphic resonance. So in terms of science and understanding epigenetics, this was a profound advancement. Actually, Rosalind Franklin, um, Francis Crick, James Watson, I think that um, since 1951, two, three, I think that since then, it's only been about 70 years. And we've had now a profound um, transition into what is now going to be the biotechnology age um, in this next decade and, and beyond, where we'll have things like a constant stream of our body's biometrics, and we'll be able to make tweaks like like jets that have hundreds of sensors on them and we'll be able to also increase our longevity and retain youthful homeostatic capacity and that's all to the thanks of understanding this code of life and also to how to augment it and uh so this is very profound and and i i want to explain briefly that the idea of epigenetics that these newly acquired behaviors leave things like DNA methylation and affect histone tails and that's passed down to, to future generations and that's not just behaviors but that's also things like 
the tr 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 traumatic instances as well. And if you do things like heal what has been a trauma in your lineage, it you can actually butterfly effect that downward and outward. Uh, and I think that's, that's very profoundly important. Cells also have very interesting processes like this with their cell cycles and their checkpoints and where they also have, if they have a certain amount of protein that's built up, that it may be indicating that it was harder to have mitosis happen. So there is a memory mechanism, even at the cellular level. And you were mentioning this earlier as well, that a lot of what the, the, was a very profound enrichment that happened from Carl Jung's work with the collective unconscious and archetypes and dating back to what we were talking about with Plato and Aristotle and their mentality around this. This is, this is extreme. This has been now triangulated on from so many different angles in terms of what is truly underlying in a maybe a sort of implicate as like a David Bohm would say or a, some sort of a source code or or an or a, an animistic essence of sorts and and what what is that Rupert that is beyond epigenetics well epigenetics as is currently understood epigenetic inheritance is um, the way in which genes can be switched on or switched off by methylation or changes in histones or whatever. Um, it's conceived of in uh, molecular terms. That's one reason it's the taboo against the inheritance of acquired characters was lifted around the year 2000. In, in the 20th century, it was one of the most taboo topics in biology. You could lose your job and you suffer serious career damage if you said you believed in the inheritance of quiet characters. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's a major shift. Um, so um, that's a, a welcome change. Uh, but it, things can go further, you see. Now, let's take an example. Um, if you train rats to learn a new trick, um, this is one of the experiments for morphic resonance. Yes. Um, it's, this experiment's actually been done. It was started at Harvard decades ago. Um, you train them to learn a new trick. And it turns out that their children learn it quicker and their children even quicker. And it went on over 30 generations, them getting quicker and quicker. Um, and this was interpreted as the inheritance of acquired characters because it was from the parents to the children. And this became um, very controversial research because of the taboo against inheritance of acquired characters. Then someone did a control experiment. They tested rats uh, that had, whose parents had never been trained in this trick. And they found they were getting better too. They were all getting better. Uh, so it wasn't just something passed on through the genes or modification of the genes. Uh, there was something else going on. And that's, I think, where morphic resonance comes in. Mm -hmm. So I think in inheritance, we've got several different aspects to inheritance. We've got DNA, which explains the structure of proteins, uh, and some of it's concerned with switching on and off other genes. We've got epigenetic inheritance that can silence or uh, activate genes, and that can be passed on uh, uh, in some cases. We've also got morphic resonance, and then, of course, we've got cultural inheritance, and that too can involve morphic resonance. When a baby learns a new langu a language, for example, I think that it's not just a stimulus response psychological process. I think that that learning is accelerated by morphic resonance. So um, it underlies cultural inheritance as well. Now, would it be fair then to say that it, it is potentially both, like you just indicated. There is a, a tremendous amount of the, the current scientific paradigm that is, that like you just described, unlocked the, the next level of understanding genetics and epigenetics. And so we have this general understanding now and the way that that process is part of this, this, uh, the, the 
in the inheritance of of memory and then we have something else that that is at play which you've cited the example with learning with rats but there's also many other you you give you give so many other examples um with with dogs knowing when their owners come home with um with nursing mothers and that their them being able to feel when they have their uh the 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 breast milk and their babies and the need to feed you you there's there's many of these sorts of examples this kind of is also a little bit leading us into um the the science and dogma section a little bit but i i want to i wanted to just ask especially on i want to know if there's both if both these both coexist you kind of gave the indication that you have on on a on a body level you have the genetics and epigenetics and the further understandings of science and then there's also some sort of a, an implicate or an ethereal or a, a spirit or soul or animistic source code-esque um, contribution. And those two things can coexist. Well, yes, I think that I don't think it's sort of ethereal exactly, or at least it depends what you mean by ethereal, but I think it's a field. I think these things work through what I call morphic fields. Yes. And morphic fields are fields. And um, in science, we have quite a number of fields. And there's the magnetic field around the magnet. It's, you can't yeah. see the magnetic field. It's in the magnet and it's around it. The gravitational field around the Earth. It's an invisible organizing structure that keeps the moon in its orbit and keeps us down on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the electromagnetic field of your cell phone, which is active inside the cell phone, but extends invisibly beyond it. And um, now all of these are fields, and the point, fields were first introduced into science in the 1840s. They're not part of the original Newtonian mechanistic picture. And uh, most of our modern technologies are field-based technologies. I mean, yeah. right yeah. now we're talking on Zoom. The whole of this works on electromagnetic fields and transmissions and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think morphogenetic fields probably the form shaping fields and morphic fields, which is the generic term to cover form shaping fields and yeah. behavioral fields and social fields. Um, I think these are actual organizing fields, invisible organizing structures, their patterns or regions of activity in space and time. And so it may sound the fact they're invisible and they organize things invisibly some people would say, oh, wow, this must be pseudoscience, it's woo-woo, and so on. But actually, that's the basis of the whole of modern science. The whole of modern science is explaining the visible in terms of the invisible. And once you get into quantum matter fields and uh, the quantum zero-point energy field and the Higgs boson field, uh, uh, we're dealing with a whole range of fields which yeah. underlie yeah. reality. They're invisible. They give structure and order and form to things. Morphic fields is another kind of field. We've already got several kinds within science, but I don't think it's yet an exhaustive list. Yeah, you give these, th those are very important examples in the, n not only Earth's magnetic field, the gravitational pulls, the, all of the technology in the last 150 years is now functioning off of these invisible fields to to the human eye this is very important but also even furthermore when you look at even just something as simple as a tree the tree is not just a static tree there's a massive field around the tree that is constantly doing the the o2 and co2 exchange that is it's just happening all over with from the leaf sections all the time and if you're next to it you're inhaling that and exhaling so you're like you're there's a so that's also a big funny thing with the whole identity thing. If you identify yourself as just your ego, or if you identify yourself as also that tree, that's a little bit of a separate thing. But you, you give also this really important point about uh, social groups, I think is very important. Like you just listed, there's just, there's something else 
happening. So we're going to coexist these concepts of genetics, epigenetics, and the way science is understanding the uh, collective inheritances of, of memory. But we're also going to add to that picture, we're going to add to that something else that is that that's occurring across a morphic field for humans. And there's got to be ways to do this better. I mean, we'll give this brief example in sports, and then I'll, I'll make the 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 question here but just it it's so true that in social groups there's almost some sort of a a a morphic field that happens if you've ever been around especially in like northern california what happens is you have uh, an extremely um homogenized perspective about a specific topic and you basically can't you can't really enter a new idea into like a social group if they have a homogenized idea. And with athletes, there's something going on with athletes. Myself and one have played for so long different sports, especially in team sports, where there's some sort of a collective intelligence that's happening that is, it's it's in a sense, it's, it's some sort of an extrasensory perception and there's something going on between the teammates where they're able to be in complete surrendered flow to communication and sharing. So ultimately, Rupert, what we can have science do to further prove this is more randomized control trials around how our capacity to quickly learn around the world new ideas and so th- this can be a way for science to further probe and understand that with all these examples. Um, yes. Well, looking at social fields, um, yes, I think that there are fields that organize social groups. And I've looked at these in animals because all social animals have social fields. They all have to coordinate members of the group. And when you look at flocks of starlings, for example, which we have here in England in the winter, huge flocks of up to a million birds, they fly around before dusk. Um, and the whole flock can change direction almost immediately without the individuals bumping into each other. They know not only where the others are, but where they're going to go. And the same is true of schools of fish. And so there's something about animal groups that they can be coordinated by some kind of invisible connection. And the best computer models of these flock behaviors treat them as as fields, as if they're a bit like iron filings in a magnetic field. Each individual iron filing is not doing the organizing itself. It's within a larger structure of which it's part. And I think members of social groups are like that. I think that's why you were talking about a kind of consensus views that you get in societies. I mean, scientific paradigms are like that. Thomas Kuhn pointed yeah. out that with it, at any given time, the scientists share a common model of reality, a paradigm. Um, and anything that doesn't fit in is dismissed or ignored or treated as heretical. But then there's a scientific revolution and another paradigm takes over another model of reality. Um, And then the same thing happens again. I mean, his his, uh, model of scientific revolution was was rather like sort of old style Latin American uh, military dictatorships where you have a kind of dictatorship that's replaced by a different dictatorship. It wasn't scientific revolutions have involved replacing one dictatorship of ideas with another. They haven't, none of them's yet been like the declaration of independence where the sort of democracy hits science. Uh, we're still in the old model of um, uh, you know, the, 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 at any given time. And right now the dominant worldview is mechanistic materialism. Um, it's coming apart at the edges and it's uh, as I show in my book Science Set Free called The Science Delusion in the UK. Um, these dogmas of uh, materialism are actually being outgrown by science itself. We're going beyond them. So there's, there's a sense in which social fields constrain our thoughts. They also link us together. And in team sports, um, they can lead to this coordination that's sort of unconscious and almost autom- sort of automatic. And Michael Murphy looked into this, you know, the founder of the Esalen Institute, who's very keen on, on 
looking at sports as an evolutionary phenomenon. And in his book, The Psychic Side of Sports, um, co-authored with Rhea White, he um, talks about how interviewing, he interviewed American football players and a lot of them felt they were sort of telepathic with other members of the team, but none of them dared say so in the locker room because uh, they thought the others would think they were weird. Um, um, but the, this is going on all the time, I think, in, in uh, sports activities. And it's this connection between members of groups within the social field that underlies telepathic phenomena like dogs knowing when their owners are coming home and mothers knowing when their baby needs them uh, when they're miles away from the baby. Um, so I think we're linked together with uh, members of our families and members with, of other social groups through these social fields. Ultimately, this is our responsibility to create randomized control trials to probe this. In a, we can, let's, okay, let's jump into um, the, the dogma of, of science. So the, you, you've said this so well in the science delusion and also in, uh, you know, in science set free that the, we need to free the spirit of inquiry. And that's an, just a superb way to put it. And another way to put it that I've really enjoyed is the idea of, 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 of being able to parse and identify where the baby is in the bathwater, take the baby out and, and drain the bathwater. And, and the same thing's true for spirituality in the sense of we got to drop the dogmas and fundamentalism in both science and spirituality. And we have to, and we have to prop up this spirit of free inquiry. And, and also the idea of polymaths or heretics or, just people that are trying to plant a flag beyond like, here's an idea, morphic resonance. Okay, great. It's beyond the edge of science. Like we've planted this flag beyond the edge of what we know. The peri here's the perimeter. And so the idea is now we have to make randomized control trials. We have to make, it's a hypothesis. It's a theory. And now we have to test it. And, and the idea is that if you just say, no, 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 it's not possible. Then all you're never actually that that's dogma. That's not, not pursuing science, that pursuing science is making actual steps towards that flag. And there's many of these flags that we can plant outside of the edge of what's known. And so this is really the idea of propping up the baby and draining the, the, the bathwater. And I, I also really liked a lot how you put the idea of, of habits rather than laws in a sense, because we just, in a, in, in a sense, we don't know if things like the gravitational force, uh, the con gravitational constant or the, the constant of the speed of light or uh, Rupert, if we're orbiting the center, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way every 225 million years, and we're going through patches of dark matter or dark energy, or if there's different um, solar flares happening from our sun or the gravitational pull from Jupiter or Saturn, or there's a biochemical change that's happening in the center of the magma of the earth, or if there's one species on the planet that's causing another species to, to, to cause us to feel differently when we eat honey or something. There's so many things that, that we don't know that nature, you gave this really good example, like imagine if the journal nature or cell or science or whatever, if, if they just had a, like a yearly section or monthly section where they reported like the weather or like the sports scores, they reported the scientific uh, habits that have been changing because of what's going on in in the the field of existence so i, I really thought that that was so eloquently um given a, a visual but do, do you really do you really feel I, just one more example here and then I'll, I'll hit it back to you with artificial intelligence rupert there's a very interesting way to understand there's a great analogy here where we have now uh, artificial intelligence perception we're talking about a lot. We're talking about the second Cambrian explosion in, in, in perception. And what's so interesting is that when, when like a fleet of Teslas is driving, 
and then the the Tesla, one of them, goes through a very specific pattern of activity that they that the collective intelligence that had not experienced before what happens is as soon as that tesla goes through that process of learning from that unique novel experience what it does immediately is it updates the collective database of all tesla's knowledge so i love that analogy in a sense of how fast a collective intelligence of artificial intelligence perception can learn. And there's some sort of analogy there with humans, especially that we can scientifically test. How is it that if somebody learns something across the planet, that somebody else in a different country across the planet can learn that faster? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, yeah, I agree. The, the, this artificial intelligence thing, which has this built-in learning, which is shared, um, is a bit like morphic resonance and co collective memory. And that's why it's so powerful, of course. If you just rely on a programmer programming things with no learning, uh, then, you know, they get it right, they get it wrong, it works some of the time. But this one actually learns and adapts as new situations arise. And that's much more like evolution and much more like the collective memory in morphic resonance. In terms of what you were saying earlier about uh, controlled experiments uh, to you put out a flag to some new hypothesis and then yeah. do experiments, this is of course what I actually try to do. <laughs> Much of my time is spent doing experiments and um, um, to try and explore these new areas. And let me just describe two experiments which I'm doing at the moment, because they're ones that anyone who's listening to this can actually do. And I'm always trying to recruit new subjects. And since uh, we have a captive audience, at least I don't know how big the captive audience is. I, this is an opportunity I don't want to miss. Um, I've got two experiments online on my website, sheldrake.org at the moment. Um, one of them is a joint attention test. And here I'm exploring something that I don't think anyone else has ever explored. It's, it's, um, the question is, if you have two people concentrating on the same thing at the same time, or nowadays with mass media, we can have millions of people concentrating, watching the same TV show, for example, watching the same football match, um, millions at the same time. Is there a kind of resonance between minds when people, you're watching the same thing as someone else? This hasn't got a standard scientific word. I, I call it joint attention. Mm. We, know, we know that joint attention, actually joint attention is established because when babies reach the age of about one, they become capable of joint attention. And it's in a very important part of normal development. That, that's why with people with babies and toddlers, they go around and they say, doggy. And they say, oh yes, doggy. And, and you, it's joint attention on the same thing is essential for human development uh, proper. If, if people who don't have this turn out to be autistic very often. Uh, so it's part of our shared uh, world. Anyway, in my joint attention test, um, you log on online and with another person um, in a separate place. And then there's a series of trials where in each trial you're shown a picture. Uh, you're just watching the screen, a picture appears. and at random, your partner may be showing the same picture or a different picture. There's yeah. a different pair of pictures for each test. Um, each car lasts only 10 seconds. The whole, the whole test lasts three minutes. So um, then uh, what you're asked after 10 seconds, uh, one of the people is asked, was your partner looking at the same picture? Okay. And you click same, different. Mm -hmm. You're right or you're wrong. By chance, you'd be right 50% of the time. Yeah, yeah. In these experiments, it's coming out significantly above chance. It's not a very big effect, but it's very significant. Um, are we talking 55, 60? What are we talking we're about? We're talking, in this case, only about 53, 54. 50. But okay. with thousands of trials, it's, okay. very, it's, it's very significant. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I'm doing a new test at the moment, comparing different kinds of pictures. It seems to be working better when you're looking at pictures of faces than landscapes, for example, perhaps because it's oh, more engaging. interesting. So anyway, okay. that, 
one of my experiments, looking at a new phenomenon. And then, of course, I want to scale it up. What happens if you've got 10 people looking at the same thing? Yeah. 10, 50 or 100. And, of course, you could do this live on TV as well, where you could do it with millions. Yes, yes. This would have an enormous effect in interpreting what's happening in modern culture, which involves huge amounts of joint attention. Yet yeah. this is completely unexplored because the standard materialist assumption in science is that minds are nothing but brains and they're insulated inside heads. So what you're thinking and looking at has no effect on me at a distance because that's impossible. Your mind's nothing but the physical activity of your brain. The second experiment that I'm running, which I invite people to take part in, is an experimental test of telephone telepathy more than 80% of the population say that they've had exper uh, the experience of thinking of someone who then rings. And they say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Or they just know who it is when the phone rings before they've looked at the caller ID or answered it at the phone. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very common experience. Um, it works especially well with people who know each other well. Telepathy is about people who are bonded socially. Now, for a hundred years or more since the invention of the telephone, people have observed this. But the so-called skeptics, the dogmatic skeptics, have said, oh, well, it's impossible that it's really telepathy. That can't happen because minds are just inside brains. Uh, it's impossible for them to have an influence at a distance. It's nothing but coincidence and selective memory. You remember when you're right, you forget when you're wrong and so on. Anyway, I've developed a test to test that. And how the test works is you register on my website, shellgrate.org. You put in the names of two friends or family members, people you know well, and their telephone numbers. The computer then, at a randomized time, picks one of these two people at random, calls them up. So say I was doing the test and you were one of my callers. Yeah. Say my wife, Jill, was the other one. Um, you'd get a call saying, this is Rupert's telephone telepathy test. Please think about Rupert. When you're ready, press one. You press one. My phone then rings. The caller ID says telephone telepathy test. It says, one of your two callers is on the line right now waiting to speak to you. Press one for Alan, press two for Jill. So I then say who I think it is out of these two people. And as soon as I guess that's recorded on that database, the line opens up and I get instant feedback as to whether I'm right or wrong. And then I can talk for up to a minute. It cuts off after a minute because I'm paying for the call. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, this test um, is giving, you know, very significant positive results. In, in my earlier versions of the test, I had four callers and there the chance rate's 25%. And we were getting uh, rates, average rates of about 45%, you know, with hundreds wow. of massively significant statistically. Yeah. And this, so this, uh, what I'm trying to do at the moment is to find out if people can get better at this by practice. And yes. if so, how they practice, how they can develop their intuition. So what I'd like to say to anyone listening to this is that if you're in the US, Canada or UK or Italy, uh, the test doesn't work anywhere else at the moment, um, then check it out. Try it with your friends. It doesn't take very long, uh, about 10 minutes of your time to do one of these tests, spray it spaced over an hour and a half or a couple of hours. And um, this, uh, if uh, I'm inviting people to try and find how to train their intuition, yes. I don't know how to train it. I'm not that good at these things. I score above chance, but I'm not brilliantly intuitive. So I'm asking other people to help with this. Um, and in fact, it could turn into a competition. Who's got the best intuition? Yeah, yeah a global competition. And well, it could end up with, it could even end up, if people find they can practice and get better at it, it could even end up with a telepathy Olympics. Olympics. A, Who's that, the most telepathic yeah. person in the world? Yeah. Um, and then I think when we get to that stage, all these boring old skeptics who just say, yeah. oh, it's impossible, <laughs> the evidence isn't there, it doesn't exist. This would, I mean, they'd still exist, but they'd become like the Flat Earth Society. They're yeah. just a fringe group. They are a fringe group anyway, but they pretend they speak for the, for the science establishment. They don't really, but they pretend to. Anyway, here's a wow. way forward.
wow yeah yeah this yeah that 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 your what you just summarized there with the joint attention study and the telephone telepathy study was basically the essence of what i was getting at with actually when you plant a flag beyond the edge and then further is you actually you yourself create the tests to further prove the hypothesis and then try and inspire other people around the world to not only create, not only participate in your test, but also create their own tests to try and prove these hypotheses. And also, I actually really appreciated the, I think the structure of the two that you spoke about, it's very important. First of all, the joint attention study, I, I really like how for both of them that you can crowdsource people from around the world. Well, US, UK, and uh, Australia, and, it and Italy. Italy, that's the telephone one. The joint attention test works everywhere. So it works everywhere. Mm. So, so this, is, this is a big deal, because if you can get people from India and Brazil and Russia and all these other countries around the world that, are, that, can, that can do the uh, jo you know, joint attention one and beyond. Let's see if we can get people around the world doing these. I appreciate how I think the structure, Rupert, that you were describing as a, somebody that is also a fellow science scientist, science advocate, science communicator. Um, it's just for me to uh, for me to view the the style of your experiments. It sounds quite robust, and in the sense of um, uh, even getting, even getting small incremental differences of training intuition, you can't, you can't pick up a basketball and just walk onto a court and start shooting three pointers. You can't pick up a violin and just start playing Mozart. You, you, you have to train your intuition. You have to train these telepathic abilities in order for you to bump up like if in that example where there's you know four in telephone telepathy if there's four options of my four friends and if on my rate is only supposed to be 25 but if i'm hitting 45 that's significant and that's also a big deal if i'm um slowly trying to compete if i'm becoming the united states best uh, most intuitive telephone telepathist. And then I'm competing against the United Kingdoms and Germany's and, and China's. And I think that's a very interesting style of, of trying to, you know, if, if Rupert, if we can take that flag beyond the edge of what's known, and if we can incentivize people to partake through a sports style, Olympic style um, process like what you're teaching. I think that's also very fun and it en it's engaging. And also the joint attention thing has a lot to do with the modern day. Uh, we're approaching all 8 billion people soon to be connected on the planet. And if you can release a piece of content and then watch how people watch the content and if they can tell if they're if other people that they're engaging with, if this person, if, if Rupert is also watching the, um, the advancement that's been made in biotech, or if Rupert's watching the advancement that's being made in blockchain and cryptocurrency, and then I pick which one Rupert's, you know, watching. And I think that's very interesting given the fact that all 8 billion people are now, we can, there's a collective zeitgeist that's happening all the time with this pacer of the cycle of media. Absolutely. Well, I think this is, it's, that's why I think it's so topical at the moment, the whole question of joint attention. There's never been a capacity for so many people to have so much joint attention. And now everyone agrees, of course, that we're interlinked through the internet and through news media and through radio and television and so forth. Um, but the big blockage to these inquiries within institutional science is this materialist assumption the mind's nothing but the brain. And that's why no one's doing research on this. Um, it's also one reason why I've, uh, I, mean, I like doing research in the public domain, and I like doing it outside universities and where anyone can take part. But it, it's yeah. also that I'm forced to work that way because these subjects are so taboo. There's almost no university where you could actually do this research and hold down a job. And, you know, the, because the, the opposition to these things is, is very, very strong from dogmatic materialists. 
I mean, most ordinary people are not opposed. Most ordinary people are interested in these phenomena. But within the academic world, there is this problem of dogmatic materialism. Anyway, I tried just to get a go, go on doing research and, and get on with these experiments. And yes. luckily, there's enough people who participate uh, for the results to come in. And of course, uh, morphic resonance experiments are also possible in the human realm. Um, it's, it's hard to set up morphic resonance experiments online because what you're trying to do in morphic resonance is seeing if a skill gets easier as time goes on. Is it getting easier to learn skateboarding, windsurfing, snowboarding, skydiving, etc.? The problem is in the real world. Rupert, could it be something like teaching a brand, could it be like a brand new sport? Because skateboarding and all these other sports are already, they're known. But if we made up a new sport in some random location across the planet, and then uh, 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 the general idea is that if I picked people of approximately same cognitive capacity and in, in one part of the planet, and we taught them a brand new, never been thought of before sport, yes. and then we picked other people of the general Real similar cognitive capacity yes. and we and we measured the time that it took them to learn this brand new sport that no one's ever heard of and that's the idea of how we could do that absolutely they should be able to learn it quicker but the problem is you know i spend a lot of time thinking about experiments and um the the problem with this particular one is that now everything is so interconnected with the internet that if you train a group of people and you say, look, we're training you this really new sport no one else has ever done in the world, within seconds, one of them is going to have it on Instagram. Hey guys, I'm learning this new sport, sport that no one has, and it's going to go all over the world. So um, the only way of actually doing this uh, would be to have a group of people who really are cut off from the rest of the world. You know, prisoners for example or um, have it done right away like if you if you take and just and you ask them hey guys just for the rest of the day don't um post about this on on the internet quite yet even though that is like our extended phenotype in a sense but just don't post about it on the internet yet and then have the group and you know if, if we're doing this in texas and then we have somebody in oxford and somebody in melbourne that it that are that are also going to do it just literally 15 minutes after the one in Texas complete. Yes. Yeah. That's good. A good idea. And actually, where this would co probably be, it would probably be easiest to do using some kind of new video game, which involves some kind of new skill that you have to learn mm. to do the video game. So this could be built into some kind of new gaming platform um, where you could have a completely new thing in a video game where you have to solve particular problems. Um, that um, no one solved before. And then it, it might be possible to get people doing it, you know, 15 minutes later in Melbourne, Australia, and that sort of thing, um, and see if they do it quicker. Okay, so, like, like, like a sort of, in, in a sense, it would be like if I'm entering into a game, because I'm, I'm a huge gamer, it, um, and have been, and I think a lot of people around the world are because it, it kind of creates a, an idea of a deeper idea about who we truly are and how this is already virtual reality, but we'll get there in a moment. The idea is that it could be the immersion into a game where I have to do a, a never before done puzzle of sorts and i yes. and i do that never before done puzzle and then immediately as soon as i'm done they're triggered in a different country around the world the next person begins doing the puzzle then the next person and these are gamers that have generally the same cognitive capacity and generally the same uh, dexterity and video game um uh capacities their their abilities have been trained so it's not like somebody that has never held a game controller before versus somebody that has. Yeah, that's right. Well, maybe the people who do this might have to do some kind of preliminary test to show that they're up to a certain level of skill. Yes. yes. Um, or there are certain games have levels anyway, pick people who are at a certain level. Um, anyway, the point is with large samples, it, it doesn't really matter about matching them too much. You can do things with, you know, if you've got thousands of people taking part, you yeah. know, the individual differences tend to cancel out with very large samples, as long as there's not a systematic bias in favor of smart people doing it first and less smart people doing it later. That's so, so Rupert, would, would you say that, um, I, see where, I see where you're going there, that's, that's beautiful. So the idea is that if we could recruit 
just a uh, thousand people around the world to, to do the same puzzle that's never been done before, but that we make this, we design this puzzle. And then we kind of have a domino effect of the 1000 people in different countries around the world. As soon as the first person's done, it's a brief puzzle. Maybe it only takes a minute um, to get it done or two minutes or whatever. And then the next person starts it. The next person starts as soon as the other one finishes. And the idea would be that generally speaking, it should be if the first person takes four minutes to get it done by the end of the 1000, the last person should be getting it done in one minute or something like that there should be a significant yes. increase well it increase would be time. the, yeah, the yeah. points would be scattered you know it would be like drawing a graph through scattered points and you know the statistical techniques tell you if you can see a significant trend would there be a significant trend towards it getting easier you can statistics enables you to deal with individual differences when you're looking for trends so you'd be looking for a trend yep. and uh, then, I mean, the more people, the better, actually, if yeah. you're doing the, the trend. I mean, there is, I, I think this would be a, a brilliant way of testing morphic resonance. Yeah. Um, I'm not a gamer myself, and I don't know people who program games, but... If I, you can help. I can help. I can help. Yes. Yeah, I, Rupert, the reason why we, you know, we have these conversations also is not only for people to get um, inspired about pushing beyond the edge of what's known, like what you're doing and, and signing up at sheldrake.org for the joint attention study and the telephone telepathy study, but also, you know, for them to design the games and then for them to do these new studies around the world that can begin proving this. Rupert, we're going to carry the flag very strongly strong moving forward and 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 i agree that i think through games especially i mean there's so many uh even in the last five years, there's so many, I know that, um, you know, uh, Stanford and, and Harvard and uh, UCSF and so many places around the world have started doing where you just take your, your device, you, t you, take, you take your device and it's something as simple as just getting that, that, uh, that notification that there's a new game that a new puzzle where we're doing a test of morphic resonance and and you know you get the notification and and you and you do the you do the puzzle and you're part of the study and you might get paid you know uh five bucks for participating it because we got a grant from an ultra high net worth family around the planet that is very interested in this exact phenomenon and so it, this is the future that we're ushering, and this is a big central part of, of this project. And so it's totally available today to do things like that. Oh, great. Well, I mean, anything you can do to help this along, Alan, would be very, very welcome. That would be great. Um, we, I think this would be astonishingly interesting. Yes. We, we have the tools now to, to do so. Um, Rupert, I have a, a, guys, a call to action get something like this out into the world faster um, and, and, uh, and let's find out these, these what's beyond the edge of what's currently known and let's test it scientifically and in a fun and engaging way like through, like through solving puzzles and games and things like that. This is a really fun part of, of the conversation. Rupert, Rupert I, have a, I have a couple more um, quick questions that I, I would like to ask you. Um, All right. Okay, okay, cool. Um, if our nature of reality is truly the one indivisible, um, indescribable um, whole that we are, and that the nature of reality is truly that consciousness that is experiencing itself across these 8 billion dissociative boundaries, and that the, the idea then would be I'm curious what you think. Would it be fair to use an analogy like a dreamed symphony? I've been playing around with this. I'm curious what you think. That we are that, that, that unity, that unity of a symphony, and that each one of us in the symphony is playing a different instrument. I'm playing the cello. You're playing the clarinet. Someone else is playing the sax. Someone else the drums. And that where even people that are playing the same instrument are playing different melodies or harmonies. And that actually your son, right? Co Cosmo's a musician, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so the, the, the idea is that if I'm, 
if and, and by the way the conductor is like a, an a, is an attractor so there's like a you know the the mathematical system is we're comp the there's a mathematical attraction for our complex system to evolve towards this uh, attractor, which, which could be like a Ouroboros or something like, a, you know, an automata orthogenesis to a recursive function or something. But the point is, is that like, is the dream symphony analogy a good way for us to understand, like if I'm playing more out of tune, let's say my cello, I'm playing more out of tune. That's because I'm serving to myself. But if you're playing your clarinet and you're playing it in tune, that's because you're playing service to other. And so the other. So the idea is that we are going through some sort of a, a dreamed symphonic uh, artistic oneness evolution and that we can both integrate into the symphony and differentiate like in calculus of our unique contribution how do you, how does that dream symphony analogy for the nature of reality resonate? Well, it does rather assume that everything is working together to start with. I mean, uh -huh. the symphony orchestra, uh -huh. Uh -huh. they have to have a shared agenda to play, uh, to have a symphony together. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's, it's not um, immediately obvious that there is, at least as far as the whole of humanity is concerned, uh, a shared symphony. I mean, the president of the United States and, you know, the, the various figures in Islamic fundamentalist movements, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, the, 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 there's so many different points of view, the, you know, Hindu nationalists in India, you, you know, Chinese asserting their power, etc. It's not clear that everyone sees themselves as part of a coordinated symphony of humanity. Um, and uh, for the dream symphony to, uh, I think people would have to sign up to be part of a dream symphony orchestra um, uh, for this particular metaphor to work. Uh, it's not obvious that's the case. Um, you could argue that there are underlying creative forces that, I mean, I myself think there are, um, working through history and that conflict is part of it and that, that conflict plays its part in the creative uh, evolution of things. I mean, a personal example, uh, when my book, uh, Science Set Free, came out, my TED talk, my TEDx talk in 2013, the, called The Science Delusion, uh, was taken down by TED from their main website because of protests from militant materialists, P.Z. Myers and Jerry Coyne, who are both militant Richard Dawkins type materialists. Um, and Ted uh, tried to uh, suppress this talk or at least hide it uh, completely unsuccessfully. And, but this attack uh, from these people who wanted to stop me having a platform uh, led to an enormous controversy on the internet. The result is that at least 6 million people have seen this talk now. Whereas before their protests, only about 30,000 had seen it. So, um, they were playing their part and, you know, I don't have a kind of personal hostility to people like Jerry Coyne and stuff. I mean, they're playing their part in this drama, but dream symphonies also include dissonances. I mean, music's not all harmony and, you know, mm. it's the diss dissonances are part of it. Mm. So it may be that, they're, that Jerry Coyne is part of this dream symphony without realizing it. Um, so I, okay. I think... Okay. So, so it could also be fair to say that not only is it that we may have different national agendas ac ac across the planet uh, in parts of the symphony, but also just that in general, um, within the symphony, the playing out of tune is not only when you're trying to like hoard things in service to self mentality, but it's also when you are um, being militant in one specific dogma. And yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Okay. And of course, people may also play out of tune, out of sheer incompetence. So, um, <laughs> uh, Rupert, um, I want to ask you on a on a um, on a telos perspective. Um, given the fact that artificial intelligence is now, 
significantly for deeper emergence. So are virtual realities, which are kind of, in a sense, when you when you immerse yourself in one for an extended period of time, you in a sense could say that, holy cow, how am I not already in one? How is this not already one? So we have AI, we have VR, we have simulation technology, simulation theory. Could it be that we're, these technologies are, are triangulating on the same thing in the sense that the Eastern spirituality has been saying for the longest time that the dreamer, the ultimate dreamer of infinite consciousness ends up uh, in this dream that we're in now, wakes up and then goes right back into another dream as in the Ouroboros continues. So is the West, what is the telos? Is the West focus on AI, VR, simulation tech? Could that be what John Smart calls the transcension hypothesis when we go inward into these substrates and that we uh, continue the Ouroboros and that we keep going through more and more big bangs and that that is our, in, that is our, uh, that, that's our attractor. Is that the telos? How, what do you think about that? Well, I think that there's, there's a sense in which artificial intelligence, virtual reality, you know, are expanding the realm, uh, certainly of what machines can do, and also of things like games and whatnot. Um, I think there's a parallel exploration going on, uh, which is non-technological through this, uh, the um, renewed research on psychedelics. Because yes. psychedelics, after all, are a way of opening up the imaginal world, um, particularly the visionary ones. I mean, ayahuasca, um, LSD, mushrooms, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, an enormously liberating effect on the imagination for many people. Um, I mean, they're not for everyone, and I'm not advocating indiscriminate use of psychedelics, and especially not uh, encouraging people to do anything illegal. I mean, I have to say these disclaimers. Um, but the fact is that um, there's, uh, as well as this exploration, um, we've also got a parallel exploration going on. And in fact, in places like Silicon Valley, the uh, exploration through psychedelics um, is often happening in the same people who are engaged in, in the, especially in uh, computer graphics mm -hmm. um, and visualizing things and virtual reality. So I think here we've got uh, this uh, expanded range of explorations that aren't based on technology. I mean, personally, I think they're more fun when they're not based on technology. I mean, I'm not very technological myself, um, but I think this exploration of consciousness um, which after all has happened in the East through meditative techniques. It's happened in the West through meditative techniques. I mean, contemplative Christianity in the Middle Ages and, and since then in the Catholic and the Orthodox tradition, monks and nuns living in enclosed orders. Some of them spend hours a day in meditation and prayer and they're exploring realms of consciousness. And they're not just exploring their own consciousness. The whole point is that through meditation and these spiritual practices, you come into contact with other forms of consciousness. That's the whole point of my recent books and the most recent one being <laughs> Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. Seven different spiritual practices um, uh, which have been scientifically investigated and are about exploring these realms of consciousness beyond our normal everyday consciousness. So I think what's exciting at the moment is there's a, a new phase of spiritual evolution beginning through the widespread availability of spiritual practices and scientific studies of them, and also all these amazing technological uh, adventures. And I think that they're, they're complementary. I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah, there's a big convergence that is happening there. And whatever the telos uh, ends up being, wherever the attractor of the complex system is heading, it's inevitably, it, it, uh, in order to be happy and have great well-being and have good amounts of peace 
and collective prosperity and individual flourishing, one needs to embody what you write about in Ways to Go Beyond, where you, where you talk about specifically um, also the practices of doing things like meditation. Um, I think people also forgot that even the word yoga means union in Sanskrit. It's not holding stretching positions. And it means union with the divine, whatever your unique combinatoric is with the divine. Um, and also gratitude is such a, a prominent one that is so important. And it's the way that science and spirituality are converging, which you've written about so much um, going out in nature. Um, very, very, very last thought is um, you are the fifth person now, including, let's see here, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, um, Dr. Robert Ajemian, Dr. Kirill Piatkevich, uh, Dr. and Jonathan Keats, and now Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Um, I'm trying to keep a list of these people because you guys are the only people that I know that do not own cell phones. And hmm. what, what you, have, you have said, well, I'll, I'll say what, you know, Aubrey de Grey has called it the ultimate destroyer of personal solitude. You have said, I do not want to be interrupted all the time. And for example, with me, this device has been off now for quite a long period of time so that I can finish this project. And it's going to be off so that I can continue finishing this project. So will you please briefly speak to especially the millennial and generation Z that is now using the devices nonstop. We use them 150 times a day. Um, will you speak to the importance and Cal Newport talks a lot about the idea of deep work. And we've been talking about this for so long, but just the, the focus focus and neurobiologists are talking about it now, the importance of that focus for achieving big goals in your life. Will you just briefly mention, um, talk about that for a moment? Well, yes. I mean, cell phones are obviously highly convenient and they're essential for many people's work life. And, and so they obviously have their uses. Um, uh, but they can easily become a means of constant distraction. And the whole point of um, deeper work is being able to focus and concentrate and constant distraction of drip feed of news and social trivia on Facebook and other social media and so um, it is just ultimately distracting and so I think that one, one of the things I suggest actually in ways to go beyond uh, I have a chapter there on the importance of holy days and festivals um, and it was always a tradition and in, 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 the Jude, in the Judaic tradition, having the Sabbath, a day when you don't work. The whole point of the Sabbath is that you, it's a day, it's a holy day. A, a holy day is a holiday, it's the same word. Yeah. Uh, you, you, it's a holy day because you don't work. And then the purpose of it is to give thanks to God, to make love, to be with your family, to play music, to have fun. And then, then for Christians, it's Sunday. For Muslims, it's Friday. But this, I, this pattern of a Sabbath, a day in the week when you have, we now have a weekend, two days. But the trouble is these have now got engulfed by 24-7 culture. So shopping malls are open, or at least they were until the COVID lockdowns. And, uh, you know, have constant Amazon deliveries, online shopping 24-7. Um, this has completely abolished this necessary time it's part of human nature to have time off together and for people who are forced to work on Sundays because they work in a shop in a shopping mall for example uh, then the employer says oh you can have Tuesday off instead that's not the point because everyone else is working on Tuesday it's it's being together being alone all together as one wishes to have a time away from all this work life and the, the workaholic culture, which America has spread to the rest of the world with <laughs> seven <laughs> procedures. Uh, I mean, America is the place where it's worst. I think workaholism um, is, uh, really does need something doing about it for our own sanity. And so I think that the minimum thing I'd suggest is having a, a technological Sabbath. I mean, ideally on if you're Jewish on Saturday, if you're Christian from a Christian background on Sunday, if you're Muslim background on Friday, um, but have a, have a day when you don't work, when you don't, when you do just have time to read books, listen, walk in nature, do some gardening, hang out with friends, make love, 
uh, play music, uh, you know, and, and not be distracted the whole time. So I think that for people who need these devices for their work, who've become dependent on them for, for their earning a living, I mean, and many people have, um, obviously you can't just give them up. But having a technological Sabbath and actually ideally combining it with a real Sabbath, a real um, holy day, once a week, and then observing the festivals, I think it's very important to, and most people observe in America Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, but there are other festivals throughout the year which are important. I mean, for me, an important one is September the 29th, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, which is a time to become aware of all those forms of consciousness beyond the human level. And the ancients thought that every star and planet had its own intelligence, which was an angel. I mean, they weren't humanoid beings with wings. They were the intelligences of the celestial bodies. The whole heavens is full of intelligence in that worldview. And for me, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels is a way to connect with all those forms of non-human intelligence beyond our own. The Feast of the Day of the Dead, um, November the 2nd, which is a very big deal in Mexico and in many Catholic countries, um, is the feast when we acknowledge and remember the ancestors, those who've gone before. November the 1st, All Saints Day, All Hallows Day, um, is when we remember the blessed dead, you know, the famous dead, and November the 2nd, everyone else. And for most people, they've just forgotten about these festivals. Instead, children remember the eve of these festivals, Halloween. Um, that's become a sort of orgy of dressing up as witches and, and, and eating candies and stuff. Um, but the festival itself has been hollowed out. And for me, again, November the 2nd is a day when I, I always go to a requiem mass. Uh, I remember my dead parents and ancestors, my dead friends and all those I know and who will give thanks for who've gone before. On November the 1st, I give thanks for all those who've been my teachers who are now departed and who've influenced me. So I think having throughout the year, you see, there are these special days, the festivals, each with its own purpose and their holidays traditionally. Um, so that there's time to give attention to these other things. So I think recovering a sense of sacred time yes. is very important. Mm -hmm. And switching off cell phones uh, when one's doing that is, is a very important part of it. So I would say that starting with special days, holy days and festivals, um, and then maybe extending it out further uh, to only having it on certain hours a day uh, it would be a good way to go. It's not a good way to go to have one's entire life engulfed by 24-7 workaholic culture. So well said. These technological Sabbaths, also these rituals that have been passed on for so long to have, like you talk about the brief moment before you dig into your dinner and with your family, just hold each other's hands and close your eyes and reflect on the beauty of the fact that you are sharing a meal. There's so many different ways. There's all these days that are celebratory days to just take a Sabbath away from technology and workaholism and just tune more inward and music, make love, um, uh, go play, be in nature, do art. Um, th this is so beautiful. And I'm really happy that, that you listed I, I, it's going to be really important potentially even moving forward to do things like just have a have day have more days where we just say okay turn down the economic machinery today and turn up the spiritual machinery today we're gonna have to have more days like that in the future that was beautifully said rupert thank you so much for coming on to the program and for uh, teaching us everything that you have today. This has been an honor and a pleasure. We're very grateful. Thank you. Oh, fun to be with you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode with Rupert. Please let us know what you're thinking about all the different things that Rupert was teaching about and talking about. We would love to hear your thoughts on those things. You can also find all the links in the bio below to sheldrake.org. Also um, on sheldrake.org, you can find all of his different books that he's authored and co-authored. Go check those out. 
Rupert also has the, the joint attention study, as well as the telephone telepathy study for you to go and participate in. Go and participate in those and actually go and share those around the world, get more people participating in them. And then also make your own studies like we were talking about regarding like things like puzzle video games. Guys, let's go do that around the world. Those are going to be important. Check out Rupert's YouTube channel. He's constantly uploading more and more great content on there. Um, did you have something you wanted to... Uh, to briefly say about the studies or yeah. No, I think that's so uh, fine. You you covered practically everything, Alan. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Um, and that's that's it. Uh, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the scientists in your communities that you believe in. Support them and help them flourish. You can support Rupert. You can support ourselves and and the simulation and our show. All of our links are in the bio below. Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace.